Our message this morning is made like us to save us. We'll actually be using two texts this morning. The first text will be John 1, verse 14, and then a little later in the message we'll go to uh, Hebrews 2, 14 through 18. It's sort of John 1, verse 14 is sort of... uh, the, the whole Christmas story in, in one verse. And there we read, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In the first Christmas sermon that I had in this series, I, I asked, why, why Christmas? What's so important about this? And I really focused on the the salvation that baby Jesus brings, that he brings this into our world, and this is what we need to look to. But as I I think of this, but if Scripture was not so clear, I must admit that that I never would have thought it, that God would would save us, and that he would save us in in something that is simply so, so amazing in such a a profound way. Can we even begin to to believe the the links in which God went to save rebellious sinners such as us, broken sinners before him, that he would do such things to to make us his own? And when you think about how how the world reacts, atheists would scoff at the idea of God, let alone God sending a son into the world that there would be a God who would even care. And they scoff at the idea of sin. Somebody who had claimed to be an agnostic would would doubt that there would be a God who would, would, they would say, well, maybe there's a God, but there would certainly not be a God who would really care one way or another what happens to us. Muslims would reject outright the idea that that God or Allah could could have a son many ways their, their view looks like it comes from, from early Christian heresies where they rejected the deity of, of Jesus Christ. And in Islam, Allah has no intentions of bridging the, the natural gap between creator and creature, let alone ever doing anything about the gap that, that sin has brought between God and his creation. And then in our world, the our side of the world, liberal Christianity, which you need to really understand is really not Christianity at, at all, rejects the, the Christmas accounts and says that there is nothing really supernatural, that everything can be explained away in some natural form. And so they would reject outright to all of God's amazing works in sending his son, the things that we've been celebrating these past, this past month, they would just reject and, and throw out the door. And now when it comes to the Christmas season and the, the issue of trying to, to get unbelievers' attention, I think sometimes Christians would rather have God work through power somehow to, to get their attention I think sometimes Christians would look at our broken world and say, why don't you just send us some some fire and brimstone instead? Sometimes we say, nothing else seems to get their attention. Yet at Christmas, we see that Christ, Christ has come in to our world, that in this we have God entering our world in weakness and humility to overcome sin and death. And again, you think about it, and for myself, I never would have thought it. You know, sometimes we're, we're so comfortable with the idea of the gospel, we've, we've grown up with the gospel, but we should really sometimes stand back and say, this is really amazing. Would we have ever thought of it? Would we have ever done it this way? So the truth is that believers should look with awe in fascination at the way God has brought salvation into our world. And our texts today tell us much about God's plan of salvation that he has been unfolding before our very eyes from that that first Christmas. So first, 
In verses 1 and 3 of, of the book of John, we see that the Word was already in the beginning. But now here we see that the Word has become flesh. And the idea is, this is the idea of becoming incarnate. The Word has, has taken on humanity. Though the Word was God with the Father, He now put, took upon Himself our humanity. We need to understand that when Jesus came into the world that He was truly human, that He was made like us. And this is the first reality that should really surprise us. Again, sometimes we're brought up with the idea, we've seen how many Christmas uh, programs, we've heard how many Christmas sermons, we, we know the gospel, and, and sometimes for us it can almost become ho-hum. But again, this, these things should jump out at us to think that the God of all glory would become one of us. To think that our great creator would, would take upon himself the, the flesh of, of creatures. Again, if scripture wasn't so clear, I, I never would have thought it. And then it talks about dwelt in our text. Dwelt is really the same word as, as tabernacle or, or tented with. And it should remind us of God with Israel in, in the wilderness, in the, in the cloud, and in the fire, showing God's ongoing presence with Israel as they, as they wandered and, and worked their way towards the promised land. And on Christmas Eve, we, we saw that the promised child would be called Emmanuel. That is, is God with us. And that's sort of reinforced now in this, this single verse by John testifying to God's ongoing presence with his people still today. This becomes part of the hope that we have. Every Christmas is about God entering our world so that we can dwell with him. And it's important as we respond to skeptics that we see that this is not made up. This, this isn't a myth. You can't look back and say these are, are fairy tales, these aren't stories, these are really accounts of, of what has really happened. And we know this because there were faithful eyewitnesses to this. There were eyewitnesses to Jesus' life, to his ministry, to his death, and to his resurrection. There were eyewitnesses to his glory. And in his miracles and the Mount of Transfiguration, the, the disciples saw Jesus' glory. It were as it broke forth, though he came in, humbled, in a humbled state, that glory just couldn't be maintained, contained. It had to sort of burst forth. And the supernatural that we see throughout Jesus' life was a testimony of the glory that was within, a testimony of who our Savior really is. And John himself was one of the disciples who had seen our risen Lord and had seen the scars, had seen the scars in his feet, in his hands, and, and his side. He was, he was a faithful eyewitness to, to what had happened. And then in, in this verse, John reveals to us why the Word became flesh. Why, why did this happen? Why would, why would God go, go through all of this effort why would God send his son? The word became flesh like us in order to bring God's grace to a lost world so that through this God's mercy might be poured out on sinners such as us. Baby Jesus was a, came on a, on a mission to save, to bring salvation to a, a hurting and broken and, and sinful world. And like the first reality, this too should surprise us. Through baby Jesus, God's grace would flow to us, to those who had been rebels, those who had been sinners. Again, as we think about this in the message of the gospel, this should simply be, be stunning. When you read the scriptures, you should scratch your head and say, who would have ever thought who could have ever imagined that God would work in, in this way to save sinners such as us? Again, too often we, we've heard the gospel so much we take it for granted. 
But again, it should stun us and surprise us as we go forward. And then our second text is from Hebrews 2, verses 14 through 18. And this part of the sermon is actually probably, for the catechism kids, almost a recap of what we've been covering the last couple lessons for, for them about who this Jesus is that we, that we serve and worship. And so Hebrews 2, start at verse 14. It says, Since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death are subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. The second. This text now gives us the why of the word taking on flesh and, and why Jesus had to be made just like us. Why, why God had planned it this way. It helps during the Christmas season, to see what God's plans for, for Christmas are. Christmas wasn't just a day that was going to be by itself. Christmas was going to be a day that was going to lead to something much greater. And that's how we need to understand it today. And the children in our text, that refers back to, to verse 13. And the children that God gave to the Son pointing us to Jesus' saving mission, that this is what he had, he had come for. And as the children shared in their common humanity, so would the one who had come to deliver them. He would be just like us. And it was not just that Jesus would be made just like us. It would be that he would share and face in what we face. And he'd face far more than what we faced. He would face pain, betrayal, suffering, and death. When we think of Jesus, sometimes we just have this, this heavenly picture of him. But we need to understand that Jesus came into this world and, and truly experienced what it is to be human because he was human. He was one of us. And through his birth by the Virgin Mary, Jesus would face the sorrows and hurts that, that we face. See, no matter what we struggle with, no matter what difficulty we face, Christ has faced. No matter how dark our, our days look, Christ has faced darker days. No matter how much separation we might feel, Christ has, has experienced greater separation. And in Isaiah 53, he even called him a man of sorrows. A man who was acquainted with, with grief. There are the ideas, his, his life was marked by this. Sometimes we think of Jesus sort of happy-go-lucky until, the, until the, the last couple of weeks of, a, of his life, but that's, that's not true. The picture is that he, he struggled with this. A perfect man, a perfect Savior, living in a world filled with broken sinners. That's the picture we need to look at. That's the Jesus we need to look at. And then our text should surprise us again as this happened so that Jesus could die. See, uh, again, like, we like Christmas to be happy and fluffy and joyful and, and, we, and those are good things in a way. But we need to understand that Jesus came on Christmas to prepare for Good Friday. Good Friday had already, was already laying before him. Our text talks about through death. Through death was not an abstract death, but was the death that Jesus would face on the cross in our place. This would be what would give us the hope and the joy that we need. 
when the text talks about the devil having the power of death, we need to understand that that's not an, a universal idea. The devil has the power of death only in the, the sense that he's leading humanity into sin, that he's tempting us and, and bringing us into our brokenness and leading us to condemnation that way. But Jesus would overcome the devil's power by overcoming death as the penalty for our sin, by, by taking away our sin, taking away the power that the accuser had by, by paying for our sins to make a way for, for salvation. And yet we live in such a broken world. And for all the, the freedom that humanity claims, it is in bondage in a way to, to the devil and to death itself. It falls for his lies over and over again. As many of us had done for years, it, it's easy to get into that pattern, to, to follow his ways, to, to fall over and over again. Yeah, we also see that many desire to remain as willing slaves to the devil. We need to understand that they will forever remain in bondage without Jesus Christ, that he is the only one who can break that. He is the only one who can overcome that bondage that our text speaks of. We need to understand, too, that that's why the gospel is so important to our day. That, that's what our world needs. Sometimes as Christians, we like to stand back and complain about the direction of our nation and our, even sometimes our community and the world. But, but we have the answer. We have the answer in the gospel of Jesus Christ that that is what they need to hear. That is what they need to believe. That is what they, they need to see. Yet for the offspring of Abraham, Jesus came to destroy our foes. No matter, no matter how great those foes seem, and again, for, from a Christian perspective, we can look around this world and we say, oh, how, how can we ever overcome? Looks like any minute the churches might collapse and, and might be scattered all over. At any moment, it looks like the, sort of the bad guys are going to win. Yet how can we know that there's hope and there's joy? We can know it because Christ has entered our world. And this too should come as a surprise to us. That the one who came as an infant, as baby Jesus on that first Christmas came here to destroy our, our greatest foes. He, he came in humility. He came in weakness. He, he came as, as an infant who is fully reliant upon his mother. And yet this is the one that God had sent into the world that, that our problems, our troubles might be overcome. And in defeating sin, death, and the devil... Jesus has brought salvation to each of Abraham's offspring. Remember, we, we looked at Galatians 3 earlier in the, the sermon series. And there we saw that Abraham's descendants are, are all those who believe in God's promise. The promise of the, the promised seed. The promise of the, the promised Messiah. The promise of the promised deliverer. All found in, in Jesus Christ. And now Jesus can be our helper because he has now experienced the, the frailty and weakness that we experience. When we, when we turn to him in, in prayer, when we turn to him in faith, and it's not a matter that he doesn't know what we faced. The reality is he knows very well what we faced. He knows what we faced. He knows how hard it is for us to survive. He knows how hard it is to, to overcome when we feel broken, he knows what it feels like to be broken. When we feel betrayed, he, he knows what it is to be betrayed. When we feel abandoned, he knows that. When we, when we feel weak, he, he knows what that feels like. And Jesus became just like us so that he could help us overcome our greatest foes. And the challenge for us today is that sadly one of our foes is ourselves our weak and wandering hearts that oftentimes prefer sin over Christ. And third, the next surprising reality is Christ is now our, our high priest standing 
standing as it were be between us and God, picture God on the one side and us on the other, and now Christ as the high priest stands between us. He becomes our, our representative. The idea of the high priest in Israel was that he would represent the people before the Lord, and, and that's what Christ now does for us. He, he represents us. But to serve our interests, to be our representative, and to stand in our place, Jesus had to be truly human. He had to, to come into this world that first Christmas so, and be made like us so he could stand in our place as our representative before our, our holy God. If Jesus was to help us overcome, he had to be made exactly like us. And in the, in the text, the, the picture is that it was, was necessary or that it was essential that Jesus has this link with us. He's not another somehow coming in and saving us. He is one of us saving us. When Scripture talks of him as, as a brother, there's, there's a reality to that. That's not an abstract thought, but the idea is that he is one of us. And then as a merciful high priest, Jesus could, could represent us because he knew our weaknesses. See, he can come and, and sort of plead our case. It's the idea of him remaining our, our intercessor. Is he pleads our case because he knows what it is to be human. He knows what it is to be frail. He knows what it is to be weak. And he calls out for us. And he can have true compassion on us. And he knows our, our great needs. And as a merciful high priest, Jesus brought the mercy of God to weak and frail sinners in need of salvation. That's, that's the picture. That's the hope that we find on, on Christmas. It's not just that there was a baby born in Israel a long time ago, but that he had a mission and, and he came for a purpose. He knows our needs. And he offers God's mercy to overcome our needs. See, there's nothing that we can bring to Christ that, that he doesn't already know about. There's nothing we can bring to Christ that Christ says, oh, well, that's beyond me came into this world to become one of us so he could truly represent us in every way. And then to give us true hope, we read that Jesus is a faithful high priest who does all that he was appointed to do. See, this becomes so important for us and for our world is that so many have the idea that we have to add something to Jesus to be saved. That Jesus might get us most of the way or, or some of the way and then we have to add something, something to that. But the idea of Jesus being a faithful high priest is that he has done all that was necessary for us. There's nothing that we bring to the table that we add to our salvation. He has overcome for us. He has made the way. And so the one who came to save us is worthy of our, of our trust. He's worthy of our faith. He's worthy of us entrusting our, our eternity to. And though from before he took on flesh as a baby, Jesus knew that Golgotha and the cross stood before him. He would not flinch or falter on this path. See that... The cross wasn't secondary, the cross was primary. The cross came before the birth in a way. Jesus knew that his birth was a stepping stone to the cross. And Christ would be faithful to us and faithful in doing all that the Father sent him to accomplish. See, this is the foundation for our, our hope on, on Christmas. See, see, we as a church often talk about things like joy, peace, hope, and love at Christmas time. But then sometimes we, we forget what actually is the foundation for that hope. Hope isn't just a, a fluffy term that's just sort of out there to make us feel good at Christmas. Hope is the idea that we have an assurance of what lies before us, and that's what we have here. 
We can trust our today, our tomorrow, and our eternity to Jesus Christ. We have true hope because we know what he's done for us. And as our high priest, Jesus has faithfully represented us and the Father, making sure both of our interests were, were covered in full. Again, he's fully sufficient. He is able to save us completely, and there's nothing that we can, can add to that. that that's so important in our day and, and through, actually throughout Christian history because there's always been the temptation to bring something else in. But as the faithful Savior, Jesus does it all. He has paid the price. So both our interests and the Father's interests were that our sin debt be paid in full and forever removed from us opening the door to forgiveness and reconciliation. Oftentimes this time of year, you, people talk about peace, and they, they want to have the idea of world peace, and sort of the, the editorial in the, the recent Freeman Courier was the idea, well, peace is just so hard to come by. The problem is they're looking for the wrong peace. The peace we need is not necessarily at first with, with one another. The peace we need is with our God. That's the peace that, that Christ brings. That's the hope that we have, that we can be reconciled to our Lord through Jesus Christ, bringing us the peace that the angels spoke of that first Christmas. Then another surprising reality we read of is propitiation or or atonement. There the idea is on the cross, Christ took our punishment for sin. He wasn't up there representing himself. He was up there representing us. All of our sin, our brokenness, our guilt, and our shame was placed upon him. To bring the forgiveness of sins, we see that Jesus in Jesus, God has taken upon himself our, our punishment. Because that's the only way we could be delivered. We couldn't withstand it. So you talked in our, at our catechism class that nobody else could withstand it. There's not a, another creature who would withstand it. Only God coming into our world as one of us could, could pay the price, could withstand the, the punishment. Jesus was not only the, the high priest, he was also the sacrifice offered in our place. He was the true unblemished lamb slaughtered so that we might have life. And through this shocking move, and only through this shocking move, are we reconciled to our Lord. So there's not many ways of salvation, there's not many paths to take. This is the only way because this is what Christ has established. This is what he's achieved for us. He's, a, he's the only one who has opened that door. And then in the text it talks about the people. The people here refers to the offspring of Abraham who are, who are children of faith as we had looked again earlier in Galatians 3. Through this through this, we receive the blessing of Christ's saving work. So in reality, Jesus took on our flesh, becoming like us so that as our high priest, he could make us once again children of God. And you think about that. Again, we, we like to think in those terms like, oh, it's all, that's the normal thing, it's the natural thing. But again, when we, when we see what, what was done for us that we might be saved, who would have ever thought it? I would have never thought it. That God would deliver us from our sin against him. That he would open the door. That he would make the way for us. And that he would do it in this manner. Again, we sh should never take the gospel lightly. It's, a, it's something that's truly amazing and, and astounding. Like the hymn says, amazing grace. And too often we become so comfortable we forget how amazing it is. And that's what our texts show us today, is this is what God has done. This is the hope that we, that we now have because of Christmas. And finally, while many 
prefer cute stories on Christmas instead of sound doctrine. It is these biblical truths about Jesus that now gives us our, our Christmas hope. Mushy Christmas stories offer no salvation. Mushy Christmas stories don't tell us really what our Savior did for us to save us. They may make us feel good in this life for a time, but they'll leave us empty and without hope for eternity. This is the hope that Christ has brought us that through that first Christmas. This is what we need to look to. Again, a, a mushy story might make you have a feel-good moment, but will it save you from your sins? This is what saves us from our sins. This is what makes us God's children. This is what brings us home. And as we face life's difficulties, hurts, and temptations, we now have a Savior who knows what we face. And in knowing what we face, He, he knew what we needed he knew what was necessary for our salvation. He knew what had to happen for us to overcome. And we can know as we turn to Jesus in faith that he has walked this path and that he's walked actually a path far more difficult than we will ever face. Could we ever imagine even being in Jesus' shoes, walking that path, and yet he walked that path for us. He walked that path for our salvation to give us hope that we might truly have peace with our God. And so our hope is not simply that Jesus came as one of us, but that he came to save us. That already on that first Christmas morn, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, that, that was already our Savior come into our world to make us his own. And we see too that he came not simply to save us, to make us a little better in this life, or to make this life even a little bit more bearable, but he came to give us a better life. He came to give us eternal life with our God, for he is our Emmanuel. Coming into this world as a baby like we do, was but the beginning of Jesus' earthly mission to save us. And while we, we take in Jesus' incredible coming on that first Christmas, as he took on flesh, we also now need to, to look forward. So again, I, I think too much of the world and even too much of the church stops at Christmas Day. And say, we, we like this baby Jesus because it's safe. He's non-threatening. He doesn't challenge us. He doesn't remind us of our hurt. He doesn't remind us of our sin. He doesn't remind us of our brokenness. But Christmas must point us further down the path. We cannot stop at Christmas. So already as we consider baby Jesus in a lowly manger... Believers also must consider and understand how Christmas leads us to Good Friday. How Christmas leads us to the cross. How the birth of Jesus points us to the way he would save us. Jesus' mission from the beginning was our salvation. And he took on a human body so that he could offer it up to God as a sacrifice for his people's sins. That becomes our hope. Again, Christmas, a lot of times people like the fluff, but is the fluff what saves? Or is the fact that Christmas leads to the cross, to the cross point us to salvation? Baby Jesus will grow up to be a man who would stand in judgment for us to die in our place. But even there, we, we can't stop. We never stop on, on Good Friday. We always, always end Good Friday looking forward to something greater yet. So now Christmas also leads us to Easter and to Jesus' victory over sin, death, and the devil. The first Christmas would lead to God's mercy being pour, poured out on sinners such as us to give us life 
to overcome our sin, to overcome our condemnation, that we could forever be with our Lord. Again, this is a truth that I never would have thought of. And when we think of the gospel, again, from beginning to end, it should shock us. Whether it, whether it was the baby born and laying in a manger, or the Son of God giving up his life on the cross for us, or the victory on, on Easter over death and sin so that we might have life, all of these things should stun us. Amazing grace should always remain amazing to us. Should never be something we, we take lightly. Again, sometimes we struggle that. We, we've grown up with it in the church. We, we sort of know the details. We, we've had it so long that we sometimes take it for granted. But Christmas should be a reminder of how astounding this truly is that God would take on flesh to become one of us so that he might save us. Who would have ever thought it? But Jesus was born like us that first Christmas so that he could give us victory over our foes and give us hope in a world that oftentimes seems hopeless. And now this too is the hope that we need to, to share with the world. Again, a lot of people for Christmas, they, it covers up the hurt and the struggle and the pain. And then by New Year's, they're, they're drinking it all off and trying to kill it again. But we have the message. We have the hope. This is the hope that the world needs to hear. We need to appreciate it so that we can tell it to others to say this is the hope that you have. Do not trust yourselves to world leaders or to national leaders. Don't look to the professionals or the medical field. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. This is what the world needs to see. This is what the world needs to hear. Jesus came to be one of us so that he might save us. And this is what we look forward to as Christians already on this Christmas. Jesus was made just like us so that he could save us. Amen. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, again, help us to stand amazed. To look at Christmas, not as just some baby, but as the creator taking on the flesh of the creature, of the all-glorious one wrapping himself in humility, so that he might live, that he might die, and that he might be raised for us. Help us to truly appreciate the, the gift of your grace, the salvation that you bring. Help us to be satisfied in that, knowing that you have done this for us. And Lord, we pray too that as individuals in the church that you give us opportunity to share, to share this, this message of hope, hope that can look past the wars, hope that can look past COVID, hope that can look past broken relationship, hope that can look past broken bodies and broken health, hope that says my Jesus has overcome. Hope that says, in him, I have all that I need. So, Lord, help us now, this day and forever, to entrust ourselves to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.